Here we are, talking about season one of Daredevil, which honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, feels way older than it is. That might just be because of the number of these seasons that have come out between now and then. But is that just me, or does this feel like way older than three years? Um, now that everything, now, I mean, looking at where the Netflix shows have gone now, uh, it, 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 it definitely does feel older. Than it is, and that definitely make a note to talk about that, like how the the shows that have come after this kind of affect my opinion of it. But for now, I guess uh, I don't know. If, do you want to give opening thoughts on this first, or I suppose uh, because I haven't asked you this yet, just what sort of made you want to talk about specifically just this season? of this show right now? Just because, well, as you know, I recommended that one of our favorite uh, channels does an in-depth review on it. But, um, yeah, just there's so much. This show, well, season one by itself is just so dense. And I think there's a lot to really sink your teeth into and talk about. So I wanted to knock that out first. And uh, if you want to do season two, which I would love to do, we can knock out season two sometime after this. But yeah, um, I uh, I love this show, uh, in particular season one, and uh, this makes the tenth time I have seen season one in its entirety since it came wow. out. Yeah, I, I go back that, to this show a lot. Yeah, this is I've been meaning to go back to, to this for a while, and I was happy to have the excuse. Because prior to this, I've only watched it, I think, at most three times. If I recall correctly, I uh, binged it across like two or three days by myself when it first came out. Then I watched it along with my mom and my sister, and then I watched it along with my dad separately. So I watched it like the whole season three times in quick succession, I want to say in like the course of a couple of weeks. And then I just never went back to it. And uh, I'm really glad that I did now because, yeah, it really holds up. I think part of why I was kind of apprehensive about going back to it, and this again has to do with the other shows, is I'm kind of like in a weird place with the Netflix shows right now. And I think that applies to a lot of people where this show came out and it was really unique for how kind of how much it took its time and how deliberately paced it was. And these shows just keep doing that and it keeps feeling like each show gets slower and slower and now it's threatening to just be kind of boring and I would say for stuff like Iron Fist and Parts of Defenders it is boring. So I was kind of worried if I would go back to season one of this show and it would just be like it's also boring because of how slow it is and it only worked for me then because of the novelty of like that was new as in comparison to like the movies, which are much faster. But uh, no, this this season really holds up, I think. I have one or two problems with it, which are problems that I had with it for a while. But uh, as a total package, I think it's really, really great. Um, issues, issues, issues. Um, you know, I've, I've, watched, I've watched this show, or at least season one, 10 times. And so, um, I still have a hard time pinpointing something that I would call an issue. I think um, all the character character dynamics are handled really well. Um, I love the story. Um, I love that the the show takes its time, but again, I'm never bored. I'm always invested, and uh, the action scenes when they hit, they still hit hard and brutal, and they're really dynamic and fun to watch. And um, the, the characters in the show are just captivating and uh, yeah. I'm just I'm on this journey with them and it you're just you're just watching one, one big long movie and it's just it's just so great I love this show yeah and this this season in particular I feel like not to say that any of the other shows are like like film real like movie quality to the cinematography of this season that I don't think we quite get after this. Like there are moments 
in certain episodes where I'm like, oh no, you could put this in theaters and it would hold up with like on the level of presentation as some stuff that ends up in theaters. And I don't know if I would say that necessarily about any of the other shows or even season two of this show, but uh, I don't know, I could go back to some of those. But uh, yeah, when I say issues, I don't think there are any overarching issues with this uh, show. Like, there's nothing about it I can complain about that's consistent. I just think there are a couple of plot points that are lazy or one or two character decisions in the moment that feel like, uh, that could have been done differently. But uh, yeah, as far as just like overarching stuff that's throughout the entire show, I can't think of anything I have a problem with. Like, I know there are people who, uh, especially in season one, kind of took issue with uh, Foggy as a character. Like, I don't think anyone hated him, but there were some people who thought, like, he was a bit whiny. And uh, I don't have that at all. Like, I think... Neither do I. I think he's really, like, sympathetic and easy to empathize with. And when he does complain about things, it's always things like, no, he has a point. Like, this is kind of... Like, uh, the whole episode, Nelson v. Murdoch, I know some people were like, ah, but Foggy's not even trying to see where he's coming from. It's like, he's reacting the way I would react. And when Matt says stuff like, um, you don't know that if you were doing something like this, you wouldn't keep it a secret from me. And he's like, no, I do. I would tell you. It's like, I believe him when he says that. I think... He's the type of guy who would at least let Matt in if the roles were reversed. Yeah, we, we see, like, in, in that episode, when we get the flashbacks, like, Foggy, and, like, even, like, throughout the course of the show, like, Foggy pours his heart out to Matt, and he, he doesn't have any secrets. Like, there's an episode early on um, where uh, where um, they're talking about uh, secrets really briefly in a conversation, and uh, Foggy's like, I don't have any secrets. I'd like some, but I don't have any. And you're like, yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, what, were uh, what were you going to say, Nick? <laughs> uh, I was just use that to uh, jump on a different character. We can talk more about Foggy if you want. But I just, uh, it occurs to me that that is kind of Matt's whole issue and why also Stick is kind of right. Because Stick is way more of a jerk than even I remember him being in this season. He's only really in the one episode, but he's just so terrible. Like, you, you understand that he's, he's single-minded about this war, and, and he's just, he does not, he has no run for emotions of any kind. And he keeps trying to drill into Matt, like, you can't let people get close to you. It's just gonna cause problems. And he's right, because if Matt didn't get close to people like Foggy and Karen in the first place, he wouldn't have to worry about this kind of emotional thing that he has. But we as an audience are glad that he has that connection, because that's what keeps him, you know, grounded and sympathetic and different from a jerk like Stick, who's just willing to kill children. But it makes things difficult for him because he can't be unemotional. And so you can't... He wears his emotions on his sleeve, but at the same time, he's trying to keep all these secrets, and that's something he can't make work if he's going to have people close to him. That's very true. I want to put a pin and stick and get, get back to him later because um, that's one of my favorite episodes in the season, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. But... Um, first, I want to talk about how I felt about this show just initially when I heard it was being made before we even uh, before we even saw a trailer for it. So when this show was first announced um, by Marvel, um, it, they announced that they were going to be doing um, these uh, these kind of darker uh, Netflix shows and that they were all going to culminate in the Defenders. And the first one they were going to do was Daredevil. Mm -hmm. um, now, as we've talked about, I've liked I like the Daredevil movie more than a lot of people do. Um, I grew up with that movie, kind of in the not in the same way I do with Spider Man because I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it when it came out on DVD, but I really liked that movie even as a kid. Just like it, I don't know, it just I like the the creepy like kind of goth uh, atmosphere of it, and um, I liked uh, I just liked 
the concept of Matt as a character, and that got me into reading some of the comics when I was a kid. Um, like I read a little bit of the classic Frank Miller stuff and uh, and some of the Bendis stuff, as well as um, Kevin Smith's Guardian Devil, which is really the only Kevin Smith book that I've read. But anyway, um, I I like the character and I like that movie. The movie's not, at least the theatrical version is not a legitimately good movie, but the director's cut is. I would call that a legitimately good movie. So, um, I really liked uh, Daredevil as a character, um, and I was very, very excited that Marvel was gonna be doing their take on him, and we'd, we'd be getting it as like a long form show on Netflix. And uh, I didn't have much of a connection to um, Luke Cage or Iron Fist or any of the other Defenders, um, I never read any of their comics, uh, except for Alias. I read that like a month prior to when Jessica Jones came out. But Daredevil was the only one I really cared about. And um, it's looking at where ne the Netflix shows are now, it's kind of sad that Jessica Jones, and to a small degree, Luke Cage is, like I care about, I care about Jessica as a character now. Um, I barely care about Luke Cage and I don't care about Iron Fist at all. Um, but now, now that we finally got the show and looking at where we are now, I really wish that they could have like maintained this kind of quality because I, we get to Defenders and it's super underwhelming and it's aside from like the character dynamics, it's not a very satisfying like co coalition of what we've gotten. Yeah, and okay, I was gonna save this for later, maybe even towards the end, just talking about the other shows, but, um, yeah, and thanks for reminding me, because I actually forgot that, uh, the build to Defenders was planned as early as, like, them working on this show, because, I don't know, I guess I kind of reframed it in my head as, like, they were working on this show and then it did well and then they decided okay let's build to defenders but no the fact that they've had the plan from the very beginning just makes it all the more disappointing that like specific things in this season that will then be paid off in defenders aren't as in because like madam gal coming off of this season of this show is really fascinating and interesting and you have no clue what her deal is and you're expecting it to be this like when she leaves and she's like, I'm going back to my homeland. It's like China and she's like somewhere considerably farther. It's like, what does that mean? And she just kind of like disappears off that roof. And it's like, okay, this is really cool. What's this building to? And then Iron Fist and Defenders both just kind of really drop the ball. And it's such a shame. And it's uh, even beyond just like plot points. I feel like in terms of and this has to do again with this being more cinematic, I think, visually than the other shows. There's, I feel like we're promised something by the end of this show that we never really get. And it's not even just with the Netflix shows, it's with all of Marvel television, I think. Because, um, and I think this is encapsulated in the bits of the last episode where we've been building like 13 episodes up to Daredevil in costume. And then the final episode, we get him in the costume, and it's so cool, and it's so rad, and it's like such a cheer moment, and we give him the name Daredevil, and we even like acknowledge in the show, hey, Daredevil is a better name than the Devil of Hell's Kitchen. And it's, I feel like ending this show, we've got this vibe of like, okay, we've, we've slowly built to it, but now after this first season of Daredevil, we can have like, you know, superheroes. We can do, we can keep it grounded, and it doesn't have to be, like, as out there as the movies get, but we've built to a place where we can believably have people running around in costumes, and just people might question it, but it'll be fine. The audience will be on board. And then I feel like immediately after this, we just step back, and we've never gotten to that place again. Because outside of maybe Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and dear sweet Jesus, some bits of Inhumans. We don't do costumes. We don't do names for anybody. Like Cloak and Dagger is new and I'm enjoying it, but 
that's its own thing. Runaways. I mean, we gave Jessica Jones a costume and Jessica Jones, but she never wore it. Yeah, that's like an in joke. It's like her costume is her jacket and jeans and stuff. But it's like, ah, I just. And for Jessica Jones, it's fine because. The, that's, the that's playing is less of a comic book thing and more of a, a psychological thriller, like noir type thing. Yeah, and even then, the comic that they're directly taking from, she is very much in that state of, like, not really a superhero. So that's fine. But, like, we don't give Iron Fist his costume. Luke Cage is as... We kind of have bits of, like, his hoodie is his costume. And at least people treat Luke we Cage We gave like... him the classic look in a flashback. <clears throat> yeah. And at least people treat Luke Cage like a superhero in his show, and I appreciate that. And so it's not like we're never there, but we don't really capture what I... Like, the kind of world that I think we're promised at the final episode of this show. Where it's like... It's, it's superheroes, but grounded. And now it's like we're trying our hardest to kind of not be superheroes wherever possible, and I really don't appreciate that. And again, I don't it's not... wholly agree with that, but I see where you're coming from. Yeah, I don't think I'm articulating it well, but it's just like, I don't know. I wish that like the same fervor for like bringing comic type imagery to screen and like a sort of vibe of superhero comics to this like gritty television i feel like that is really perfectly captured in episode 13 and then none of the other shows on netflix or on cable have really captured that except again maybe parts of agents of shield um i want to talk about the cast ah uh, yes let's okay so i'm gonna start off with charlie cox first of all um i have to give a huge shout out to joe casada because he is the reason that Char Charlie Cox is cast as Matt Murdock in this show. Um, he saw uh, Charlie Cox in Boardwalk Empire when he was on that show. And um, he's like, this is a guy, you have to get him. And so that's yeah. how uh, Charlie Cox is cast. Yeah. And he, he is, he's absolutely perfect. Like when I go back and read the comics now, like <laughs> his voice is in my head as I'm reading his dialogue and his thoughts. Yeah, it's 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 sort of miraculous how with maybe two exceptions and now I'm even because of stuff that we won't get into I'm maybe less uh, I have less of a problem with Finn Jones but uh, for the longest time I think with a couple of exceptions being Finn Jones and the cast of Inhumans I don't think any Marvel thing since the MCU was started has miscast their leads I think every single lead in a movie or a TV show has been cast perfectly, and Charlie Cox is another one of those. I'm like, I know there, I know one or two people who don't care for him in this role, and I'm like, what are you talking about? He's great. He's got it's so like, much gravitas and so much um, emotion and depth to him. Um, I yeah. love the uh, just even just his little facial tics and like the way he moves, he moves his eyes, where like. They didn't have to give him any contacts. He just he just moves his eyes like he can't see anything in front of him, and he's never directly looking at anything. Yeah, yeah. and he also does I notice with uh, his hands a lot, where uh, if he's walking around without his cane, or if he's like reaching out for a chair or something, he'll do this thing where he'll like reach out and he'll just slightly miss it, and then he'll get it the second or third time around. It's like ah, that's so great, and you almost don't notice it. And uh, especially since with the mask and with his uh, blind uh, shades, so much of his screen time is spent with his eyes obscured. He has to rely on the rest of his face to convey his emotions properly. And he's really good at it. And uh, in keeping with the sort of thing that we do through this whole show, which is paralleling him with Kingpin, he, I feel like, is doing almost the same thing Vincent D'Onofrio is doing where they're both really emotional characters and yet they have this kind of veneer of stoicism and so their emotions will just always be bubbling right under the surface and you can tell that they're trying to be like 
low and professional, but then some moments it'll just be like, like really visceral, like they're about to snap and they just stop themselves. And I think both yeah. of them do. Mo- moving on to, to um, Kingpin, Vincent D'Onofrio, um, he's he's also perfectly cast and he's fantastic. Um, comic book Kingpin is played um, not nearly as emotional as his version, but uh, he's got, in the comics, Kingpin has that anger management thing where like he tries desperately to pretend like um, he's always calm, cool, and collected. Um, and nefarious and nothing ever gets under his skin but you know Daredevil's constantly screwing up his plans and that infuriates him yeah Um, and in this show he's played as essentially a child like he he never grew up it is as um as uh, eloquently as he talks sometimes at heart like he's still that same kid who killed his father when he was 12 and he never really grew up after that yeah and i think it's really how much of the sort of childish nature of his i think comes from fear and like specifically a fear of like how he's perceived and what kind of person he is because it's not just like in the comics kingpin or in some of the cartoons or even the uh, the, the ben affleck movie where his whole thing is he wants to seem calm and collected because he's a professional and that is just like practical. He's a businessman, he makes business dealings. It's in his best interest not to come off like sort of the rage case he really is. But here, specifically in this season, he wants to think of himself as the good person. He wants other people to see him as a good person. So there's that added pressure to be like, to come off nice and how he's not the type of person who takes joy in violence when clearly he is like when he gets the chance that the chance to just let loose on people it is clearly very cathartic for him but he doesn't want to accept that part of himself and he doesn't want other people to think of himself as that guy morally not just professionally so that's an added layer of like okay i've got to keep up the pretense or or else I am my father and everything I think about myself is wrong. And that just makes him more like off balance and less confident seeming because he's constantly got this pressure from himself. And I think it's very interesting that uh, that really doesn't change what, you, what we were speaking to. That doesn't change until the final episode of season one where he says, I am the ill intent when he finally accepts the fact that He's not a good person, and yeah. um, he's he's spent the whole season trying to justify his actions as you know I'm just trying to make the city better. When he's had to murder and manipulate all these people to get there, and he's finally like, you know what, I am the ill intent, and mm-hmm. I'm embracing that. Yeah, and not to get into it because I talk about some things. But I do think this is reflected in the little we get of him in season two, because there his performance is a bit different, where he's not like he doesn't seem as childish in the way of like he's kind of walking around eggshells. There he really is just big and confident and like you said, uh, nefarious and throwing his weight that weight around. And there I think because that pressure is gone. He's yeah, kind of, in in, uh, in season two, he's become <laughs> comic book kingpin. Yeah, he's accepted that he's kind of a monster, and so he just leans into it, and he's not. He's he's got way more confidence, and he's not afraid of appearances at all. Um, I want to move over to Foggy real quick and get through the rest of the cast, and then we can dive into the general story stuff. Yeah. Um, Although, just because, uh, before we talk about Foggy, just because it's a real brief thing, he's only in the one episode, um, I do want to give a shout-out to the kid who plays young Matt, just because we talked about Charlie Cox, and they're really good, these shows, at casting the younger versions of their characters, because I buy that that kid grows up into Charlie Cox. I feel like he's almost giving the same performance, just as a kid. That's, that's interesting. That's an interesting take. 
Um, yeah, I really like that kid too. And we see him in uh, the first, second, and uh, seventh episode. Oh yeah, I could stuff. I was thinking primarily about the, the stick stuff, but yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to give him some due credit because I don't think we'll have much time oh. to mention him. Oh, uh, he, he deserves it. And we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get into the stick mm. uh, episode in particular. But uh, yeah, with Foggy, he really is kind of just the average Joe. And I mm. really like that they cast an average Joe dude to play him. <laughs> like, he's not another, you know, CW pretty boy type actor. He's, he's just like a normal guy off the street. And I really like that. Yeah. And I like that um, we kind of, I don't know how intentional this is, but we kind of play him as, like, he he has this conversation with Karen late, uh, like late in the show, where he mentions like Pot or Doobie or the Mary Jane or whatever kids are calling it these days. And like, yeah, that's a joke. But part of me wants to read into that as almost like a generational thing of like, depending on just how old they're supposed to be, I can see Foggy kind of being like a weird, almost hippie child with the long hair and how we see him in uh, in college. Like he totally is that sort of like millennial pot smoker type guy who finds himself in a professional setting. And that, I think, is, like, in his attitude and his demeanor across the whole show. Yeah, he's, he's really great, really funny. Um, he kind of is straight-up comic book foggy. I mean, he's Matt's right-hand man. Well, uh, um, initially, um, we'll kind of follow him to a fault. And uh, it's, um, it's not till later. Uh, that their relationship gets uh, gets tested when the Daredevil stuff keeps uh, keeps getting in the way. Um, and that's kind of how it is with, with this show in particular. Like, once, of course, you know, once Foggy finds out that uh, Matt is Daredevil, their dynamic completely shifts into one of the most heart-wrenching episodes of television I've ever seen, which is the Nelson versus Murdoch episode. Yeah. yeah. I know that the... It, it is kind of like, maybe, maybe the reason I wouldn't go that far is because you know that at least in this season it does work out eventually. Yeah. So, so watching that episode, I'm like, okay, this is really, oh boy, but at least I know that they're going to be in a better place after this. But uh, yeah, and I do think it is interesting that, uh, like you said, he follows Matt to a fold, but not in the sense that like, he just goes along with Matt blindly, hard hard, because they do have disagreements. Like as oh, yeah. these episodes, they're disagreeing on stuff. But Matt always has this way of sort of like convincing Foggy to his way of thinking. And as we see in like flashbacks, Matt convinced Foggy to leave Landman and Zach just because deep down Foggy does kind of want to be like moral like matt and they both do have that same kind of heart to them and so foggy is kind of trying to be practical but in the end matt's like impractical like idealism is the one that is stronger of the two of them and then once once and i think that that even makes it worse for foggy because matt is the one who keeps trying to tell him like let's do this the right way let's be moral let's is this really the kind of person you want to be the one who gets people hurt like this and then he finds out that what matt has been doing for who knows how long is going out at night and beating people up and i think that's sort of like an incongruity for him and he thinks matt is almost being like a hypocrite that's because he is and that's what i love so much about daredevil is that inherent contradiction in a vigilante who's also a lawyer yeah like how how do you make that work? And I and think that's the even whole thing. I don't I don't think even now all of these seasons later Matt has really coalesced that. I think that's still a problem for him. It is, especially in season two. But uh, yeah, I, I really like um, uh, Foggy and like where we take him throughout the season. 
Um, I am a little mixed on like his kind of budding uh, relationship stuff that we do with him and Karen. Uh, and we ultimately um, let Matt have her as a love interest in season two. Like, I like that, but I don't know how I feel about, you know, like, it just, it, it feels weird to me to yeah. have, have these budding kind of romantic scenes with Karen and Foggy, and then for her to sidestep Foggy in season two and go to Matt. It just yeah. feels weird. Because I agree with that. And it's, it's a weird situation because part of me, half of me thinks the writers were going somewhere with it and then decided not to. And part of me thinks that's just kind of how relationships, yeah, relationships between adults end up happening in real life. Like, you know, you flirt around a little bit, you feel some chemistry sometimes, and then it just doesn't happen. And the big reason part of me wants to think of that is because of Marcy, who is a supporting character that I really like. And she's really interesting and multifaceted for the little screen time that she gets. But I also genuinely see the chemistry between her and Foggy. And she will keep coming back. And we'll keep doing stuff with like her and Foggy as kind of an... And like friends with benefits, if not something more thing, like into season two. And even into Defenders, maybe I think Marcy shows up at some point in Defenders. So she does keep coming back, and so I can understand why you wouldn't want to get like into like actual love triangle territory by keeping up the Karen and Foggy thing. But I agree with you that like Karen and Foggy have a real chemistry, and there really is something there, and it just doesn't culminate in anything. Like it's just kind of dropped. Yeah, and it's it's a bit weird, especially because. Um, we spend, we arguably, well, this isn't even arguable, at least for me, we spend a lot more time with Matt and Claire than we do with, uh, Matt and Karen. I don't know if that's true. At least, no, at least relationship-wise. Like, Matt's yeah. helping Karen with her case and everything, and then she eventually starts working with them at the firm, but we don't get as much, like, chemistry, like, them alone type scenes as we do with Matt and Claire, I don't think. At least in this season. Yeah, it's basically relationship building. But then again, I think this um I think this season does you know, like looking back on Claire's character and where she is now, like it is perfectly consistent with this. Like even across Iron Fist, the one thing I'll give Iron Fist unconditionally is that I think it captures Claire's character perfectly. And she's just so consistent across every show. And I think even in her chemistry scenes with Matt in this season, we're setting up that, yeah, they are both, they have a lot in common, they have a chemistry, and Matt naturally is just kind of really good at flirting with people. But Claire is not the type of person who would ever go for Matt, like, just knowing what she knows about him. He is just, like, too damaged and too like he's too much of a martyr he's too like emotionally compromised for someone as down to earth as claire and i think she realizes that really quickly which is why i don't think she like acts on a relationship and the thing i will give to matt and karen is that i i think they work better in the sense that they're both really damaged in sort of similar ways and that will become even more true going into season two after some stuff that Karen does at the end of this season, which we'll get into. But they are both really damaged people in a way that Claire isn't and Foggy isn't. So I can see that as like why those parents don't become things, just because Claire and Foggy, I think, are just too normal. They're too... <laughs> they're too emotional for people in Karen and Matt's, like, place emotionally. Yeah, that's why um, when I first watched Defenders um, and we had all those really great scenes with Matt and Jessica, part of me was almost like, okay, yeah, just, just give Jessica to Matt. Like, they're both also really damaged and they both have, like, 
like Jessica has that thing where she's always making fun of Matt, like being in costume. And yeah. uh, <laughs> like they just, they're both two really damaged people and they both understand each other. And yeah, um, Matt has, uh, Matt's a Catholic. And so naturally he doesn't approve of, you know, killing people. Um, but Jessica has a moral standing where she doesn't like killing people. She really doesn't like it and kind of hates herself um, because she's done that. Um, she, mostly because Kilgrave was controlling her, but then she also killed Kilgrave and that, that choice is still haunting her and she hates herself for doing it even though she feels like she has to. Um, mm. and but, uh, uh, I don't know. What's just up? Just because uh, I, I do want to sort of keep talking on that angle, but I also don't know if you want to eventually do one of these for Defenders because I haven't really given my thoughts on that show anywhere since it came out. So I don't know, some of the stuff like this we can save for a future Defenders talk. But yeah, I do think in the end it just comes down to Matt isn't really ready for a stable relationship with anyone. And when he and Karen will eventually try to make it work later, they can't. And I think the same applies slightly less so to Karen herself. Which is partially why nothing comes of her and Foggy. Although I will say that uh, something I was going to mention earlier is that just... I'd forgotten how much fun I'd had watching the three of them together. That, like, it's been so long since we just had the three of them sort of working, you know, as Nelson and Murdoch with Karen Page's secretary. It's like, no, that dynamic is really fun. Like, the three of them are a really, really great trio. And, like, any yeah. scene that's just the three of them together is just, it's great. Yeah, they really are. Um, okay, so, Karen. Getting into Karen. Um, yeah. when I found out that Deborah Ann Wall was, uh, was cast as Karen, um, I was a little put off by that. Um, really? I, yeah, I know her from, uh, True Blood. And, uh, ah. she's, uh, more of a, uh, sex object and eye candy than a character in that show like a lot of the women in that show but um yeah i they, they didn't i didn't feel like they really gave her much to work with in that show um she was just kind of there for me she like there was never any point where i felt she was a bad actress or anything but it's just they were using her for eye candy and i knew that they were taking a more like adult rated r approach um with these netflix shows and so i thought oh, wow, are we going to have her be nude and stuff just because we can? And then I watched the first episode, and they had the perfect chance to do that when uh, she takes her shirt off in front of Matt in their apartment, and they don't show us that. Yeah. And I I really appreciated that. Um, one scene in this entire show, and it's horrifying. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, I, I was... Um, kind of afraid that we would just use her for mostly eye candy and we didn't do that at all um, she's a fully formed uh, character and I uh, I really like her I really like her a lot um, she uh, she's very proactive very determined um, but she like in going through this whole situation with the Union Allied is also very damaged and um, very tortured with her whole ordeal. And um, I like that how that's not stopping her. And her partnership with Ben Yurik is great. And um, I really like that uh, she uh, she kills someone by by the end of the season. And uh, what, what I don't like about that is that we have yet to talk about that. Like she's still the only one who knows that she's killed a man. But... Um, oh yeah. Uh, that that never really like comes back, does these two? No, it doesn't. It that does that does not come back at all. She never tells that to Matt, Foggy, or anyone. Yeah, which is a shame, because like this season ends kind of with like her and Matt's last last conversation alludes to the fact that that is something she will have to live with, and she has been in uh, season two and in Defenders and in Punisher, and that hasn't really come back in any of that. And so, outside of just really like the sub sub subtext of how that's informing her character, you kind of are a little 
it kind of weakens that whole plot point because, and I might as well mention this now, like one of my big issues with the series that I mentioned earlier is the plot point of Wesley putting that gun on the table in the first place. <laughs> of like, he acknowledges that that's a stupid move and yet he did it anyway. And like, I don't understand why, like what was going through his head when he did that. It just seemed like such lazy writing. But I'm willing to forgive it in the moment because of the effect that that moment has on Karen. And like for her, that's a really great scene. And it's shot perfectly and it's like, ah, it's so, it's it's such a surprise. Because I feel like she, she has the line like, do you really think this is the first time that I've shot someone? And we've never seen her do that. And I think Wesley kind of has the same thought that the audience does in that split second, which is like, she being serious. And then he stands up and then she just does it. And it's like, oh my God. But it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's such a, that's such a like real, I feel lazy shortcut writing move. And it's made worse by the fact that it hasn't come up since then because it feels kind of weird and isolated in the context of this season, right? Like Wesley's gone and that makes things worse for uh, Fisk. But the whole having Karen get taken and she shoots Wesley and that messes her up, that feels like kind of its self-contained little thing that doesn't really have a bearing on anything. And it will just continue to not have a bearing on anything. It has the major bearing on Fisk, I think. But other than yeah. that, yeah, it really doesn't do anything. And that, I guess, now that we're talking about that, now that you're talking about it, I guess that is my uh, only real issue with season one is that we kill Wesley and he's just as fascinating and interesting as Kingpin. And not only did we kill him, but as you said, like, we still haven't talked about her killing him. Like, Which, still. Uh, that, I'm hoping that uh, once Fisk gets out of prison, which I'm imagining is what we're going to do for Daredevil season three, we're going to find a way to get him and Karen in proximity and they're going to have that conversation. Because be once terrifying you get, and awesome. Yeah, like once you get Fisk like back in the game, I don't see how you avoid talking about that anymore. And also just like we'll talk about her in depth later, but also Vanessa hasn't shown up since this show. And that's a real disappointment because she also is really fascinating. And I feel like maybe the only reason they killed Wesley off is because they knew they were going to end the season sending Vanessa, like, put her on a bus. Fisk was going to jail. And so then, what do you do with Wesley? Do you just send him off with Vanessa, or do you have him sent to jail with Fisk? And I can see why they would be hesitant to do either of those things, and so instead just kill him off. I don't know, I'm trying to, like, reason why that scene had to happen the way it did. Or like why Wesley dying even had to be a plot point. But I don't know. In the context of this season, before we know that it won't come back up later, just this season has its own self-contained thing. It's a great like character thing for Karen. And that you mentioned how like determined and proactive she was. She's determined and proactive to a fault. And uh, I know that I said we'll save Defenders talk for that show. But I love that in Defenders, we make a point of having her and Trish Walker hang out because Trish Walker is exactly that for Jessica Jones, where she is the one who is like defended that, not like proactive and determined about doing good and like being heroic and that sort of thing to a fault. And both of these characters go overboard. Like Trish Walker goes really overboard especially in season two with Jessica Jones. But even just in this season, Karen is like making some decisions where like she drags Ben Urich with her to the um to the uh the, the home where Fisk's mother is staying at, doesn't tell him where they're going. Just because she is so determined that it's what's the right thing to do to like catch Fisk. And that's what's eventually gets him killed. And ah uh, like uh, Yurik's wife sort of like defends it and saying like he he was never going to let it rest he was just like you he was going to get himself in this situation anyway he would have been proud but no it really is kind of frustrating 
the Karen is just so adamant about getting this done that she's putting other people in danger and not even really thinking about it. And that's a character flaw that she and Trish share and that both of these shows kind of like just take to their logical extreme. Uh, yeah, like I gotta, I gotta agree with you on that, uh, especially because uh, when Fisk confronts Ben Yurk in his in his house and kills him, before he kills him, he asks Ben, were you, "Were you the only one there that saw my mother that night?" And Ben lies for her because he knows if he says it was Karen, she's next on the hit list. Like, there's yeah, no way. Yeah. Like, once Fisk finds out that information, that Karen makes it through the night. So yeah. he lies so that he doesn't go after her. Um, and since she's the only one who was there with Wesley, um, no one else knows. And so, uh, yeah, she really suffers no consequence for killing, uh, Wesley, aside from her emotional turmoil. Although, to be fair, thinking about it from your, even if it's not just, like, clearly he cares about Karen and doesn't want her to get hurt, it's also, yes, Clearly, he does believe in the story and the fact that Fisk needs to go down and that this information that they have is key to, like, making that happen. So just practically, if he ever wants Fisk to, like, stop being in power, he can't, like, to, even if... Let's, let's, let's imagine, like, the hypothetical situation where Ben d didn't even care about Karen as a person. Like, keeping her alive just so that she can continue the work is just practical. So there is that on that level, and that I think is just... I don't know if he would care about it that much, because, yeah, I mean, Ben is also committed to taking Fisk down, but he's gotten so much pushback from that at the Bulletin, and at the end of the day, he cares more about his wife than he does exposing Fisk as a criminal. Yeah, but, like, he's gotten pushback to the point of getting fired in that episode like he was not gonna let it go like he was going to sit down and just bite the bullet and write a little non-professional blog about it if that's what it took like he lost his job already that's fair but also uh ah oh man i had a point and now i forgot what it was oh yeah my other my other small complaint about specifically that episode and uh the the killing of wesley is uh at the beginning of the next episode we open with karen like uh, traumatized over the whole thing and, and having a, a nightmare, nightmare with... she has a nightmare about uh wilson fisk that it doesn't even make any sense for her to have because she's never met wilson fisk and doesn't Thank know that you. he would say that type of stuff Yes, like that, that's my whole thing. All of that the two feels of them like stuff that he would say, but she has no reason. There's mm. there's no way for her to know that because she's never met Wilson Fisk. She's never yeah, met him. It, it's not the same thing that I have with uh, some stuff, and which has actually happened in Luke Cage season two, where it's like people just hallucinating, vivid hallucinations of people that they know. And we're just supposed to accept that because, oh, they're crazy, or they're in trauma. It's like, it's, it's, it's a legitimate nightmare. She's like, in her bed, she's asleep, fine. They've never been in the same room. How does she know his, like, mannerisms like that? Yeah, or his cadence, or, like, the way he would talk. Like, there's no reason for her to know any of that. She's never met him. Come to think of it, come to think of it, no one like who's not in this circle even knows like how tight he and wesley are how does she know that she didn't just shoot some random goon exactly. like how does she know that the person how does she know the person she killed would even matter to fisk that much that's true it's a really weird well like this that entire I, I guess to be fair though she might have gleaned that from how wesley talks about him like, he's not Maybe. just like, oh, the boss is giving me my paycheck to make sure I get you handled, or this or that. It's like, no, he says things like, Wilson Fisk genuinely cares about the city. Um, yeah. I'm not here because I want to be. I'm here because I'm needed. Like, Wesley talks about Wilson Fisk in high regard. and Yeah, he talks about him as that. Yeah. But like you could, you could see that being a one-way street. I don't think that gives Karen enough information. But like, 
just that whole plot development and everything surrounding it in hindsight is just like ah that's the one place where this whole show just kind of gets weird like it's weird lazy writing and it's like i don't understand what's happening there um like, I, I would like to the when that part is written see like what the thought process is yeah um i'd like to move over to uh claire now uh just i mean i guess we already talked about claire but all i want to add is just that um i uh i love claire she's amazing in this <laughs> show <laughs> um rosario dawson yeah. is great she's a. Uh, She's gorgeous. Um, she um, is very wise, and uh, I, I, every every line out of her mouth is just amazing. Yeah, and yeah. like like that because I've sort of been operating under the uh, the sort of like <laughs> the sort of joke that like all of these shows to a point have been like slowly in the background Claire's superhero origin story because we start she she slowly gets more and more proactive and more and more in the thick of it as these shows go on and like she will get into action stuff later but just in this show we've already set her up as like someone who is very deeply moral in the same way Matt is like she doesn't have his baggage and she's not broken the way he is but she will resort to violence if, like, the situation demands it and some, like, a little kid's life is at stake. She will torture a person, like, no questions asked. And so she's kind of really reluctant to get into all of this, like, illegal vigilante superhero stuff. And yet at the same time, she understands the need for it. And that is in her, the capability to, like, go that far. And I really, I feel like we're really smart with how we write this character. Like, again, with the idea of Defenders is something that we're going to be building to. You know that it's not a case of Claire was really popular in Daredevil, let's keep putting her in these shows. I get the sense, it's like, we know we're going to be doing stuff with this character later. Let's really make her like a real character that people are going to want to follow in this show. Yeah, they, they kind of make her the... Uh... Agent Coulson in like the phase one of the Marvel movies. Yeah. Except well, not, with Agent Coulson. I yeah, guess with Agent less, Coulson, less I, of Agent Coulson and maybe more Nick Fury. Yeah, Nick Fury is a better comparison because with Coulson, I do kind of get the impression that like in Iron Man 1, he's there to be kind of. He's the face of S.H.I.E.L.D., he's like a stand in. And you could totally see next movie, maybe we have a different agent for a different situation. And he just caught on with like the the staff so well that they just wanted to keep using him. He'd be like, no, we've got plans for this character. And uh, let me see if I have any notes on characters you've mentioned that I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, I think I've got everything. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Vanessa? And I suppose yes. just the rest of Fisk's, like, circle. Because they're all really interesting, honestly. They are. They really, really are. Um, we don't... I mean... Uh, for most of the Daredevil stuff I've read, we don't really do Vanessa at all. Um, <coughs> but uh, I do remember Vanessa being a pretty major thing um, in, uh, in Ultimate Spider-Man when... Um, when uh, Peter Parker discovers Daredevil's whole plot to uh, um, take down uh, Kingpin, and uh, Vanessa's a pretty major part of that. She's in a coma, and it's it's a whole thing. But um, yeah, I, I really like Vanessa in this show. Um, that actress is really really good. Um, she she's she's fascinating because she's someone who um, who you would think. Would, once she finds out what Kingpin, what he really is on, the, I think, their second date, uh, which is, like, leave and want nothing to do with him, she understands him and accepts him and, like, genuinely loves him. Flaws and all. Yeah, and, like, I think 
the uh, contrasting her with Claire, because like you said, Claire is a very sort of emotionally healthy, grounded, normal person who understands that a relationship with Matt just would not work for her. Vanessa seems that way at first. She seems normal and grounded. But then you get the impression that she's kind of broken in the same way Fisk is. And I'm like, I'm really curious about her backstory. And like, how did she get this way? That she I don't is get just... the impression that she is just as, well, if she is broken, it definitely can't be in the same way that Fisk is because like she, she's very comfortable in her skin. Uh, yeah. she's, very, she's very outgoing. She doesn't have a problem talking to people. Um, and that's not Fisk at all. Um, and we yeah. don't really get her backstory, and so I don't know if we have enough to say that she's necessarily broken, but I don't yeah. know. The, the fact that she's okay with Fisk being, like, a mass murderer and a criminal and, like, involved in, like, drug trafficking and human trafficking, um, she's kind of, I want to say a psychopath, maybe? The fact yeah, that maybe. she's okay with all that stuff? Yeah, maybe unhinged is a better word than broken. Just because, like, when she, um, when when she gets, um, poisoned, and, uh, Fisk says, as she's, like, comatose, I'm gonna find the person and make them suffer, it's like, yeah, of course he would say that. Then she wakes up and he says it again, and she's like, I expect nothing less, and it's like, no, she's not just, like, it's not a situation where she just, like, kind of tolerates the violence and the sort of underhanded stuff he does because she loves him. No, she's into it. Like, when he says he's gonna make someone pay and, like, kill them and make them suffer, she's like... She she, she gets weak in the knees. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, and that's, that's really interesting. Um, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed that we haven't brought her back yet, just because, at least for me personally... I don't see any reason to do that while you still have Kingpin in prison. Once he gets out, I'm, like, I'm sure um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably do stuff with her in season three. Um, yeah, not mean to bring her back either. Yeah, it is all but confirmed they're going to be adapting the uh, the uh, Born Again storyline, and um, mm. I am very excited about that. So we'll we'll see how they adapt it, what they take, what they change. And stuff like I think, that. I think her actress mentioned something on Twitter last month about uh, coming back for season three also. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be stoked to see her again. Um, and with Kingpin uh, dismantling Matt's life, it would make all the sense in the world for him to finally bring back that one mi missing piece of his yeah. now that he's finally out of prison. Like, it can be sort of the, uh, the contrast to uh, this season because this season ends with Matt not necessarily on top, but he's, you know, he has Foggy, he has Karen, they're professionals, they've, we will open next season with, like, clients coming in. As far as Matt is, like, concerned, for a brief moment at least, he's kind of on top of the world, and Kingpin is just, he's lost everything, he's lost everyone in his circle, and uh, it'd be great to sort of reverse that for season three. And uh, speaking of that circle, uh, outside of Wesley, Madame Gao is so great being introduced here. It's like she's so mysterious and cool and like above everything and you wonder what her deal is. It's like, ah, I, I need to know more about this character. Um, and I, I really liked um, that uh, towards the end of the season when Matt's fighting uh, some of her goons in that drug warehouse with the blind people, that he like that she's like able to push him back like 20 feet and he's sliding against the floor and you're like she's definitely supernatural how the heck did she do that she's an old lady um yeah, it's I, love, I love that we don't like address that at all that it just happens um and that obviously there's something m more than human going on with her yeah it's counting on the audience to get up and it's like us that it'll be paid off later and it does get paid off later, but, you know, not necessarily in the most satisfying way. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but yeah, and then there's also uh, the Russians who are taken out pretty early, but what we get of them is 
really interesting and like just how they they've got a thing where it's just the two of them like it's the two brothers they look out for each other and everyone else can just kind of screw off and uh, they stick around the rest of these guys because they're convenient and uh i like that by the end of that episode with vladimir and uh matt in the uh, the warehouse i think they kind of get a mutual respect for each other or at least a mutual understanding but the two of them are just so like angry and us against the world and that attitude is what screws them both over really hard yeah i, I really like um the the vladimir stuff um that uh anatoly um the, the uh, brother yeah. who, gets, who gets his head decapitated by fisk with a car door um fun fact about that guy i don't know if you remember but he played a blind werewolf in the third season of teen wolf yeah i thought i thought he looked kind of similar how and, uh, ironic also, is that yes and fun fact yeah, fun fact about vladimir is he also played a uh, power ranger he was the white rhino ranger i think in power rangers jungle fury you're Oh my god. Oh my god, that's so weird. <laughs> I can see that now. Yeah, that's super weird in my brain. Then, wow. And then and then Jessica Jones came out and uh Malcolm was played by the uh the, the red SP uh, the red RPM Ranger. And that was like, wait, are we just gonna do a thing where with every Netflix season we, we get a new Power Rangers character in a, like a supporting <laughs> role? And never did it again. I'm like, ah, come on, you could have. Happened. That's that's great. Um, but yeah, I like uh, I like um the relationship between the two of them. Um, with with Kingpin doing the whole car door thing, I remember that being a thing. Like when the show first dropped, that everyone was losing their minds over, like just by how graphic that is. And we yeah. topped that. We've talked that now with Punisher and, and other stuff, but uh, yeah, that that I was. Know. I, I know we've tried. I know we've tried to top it, but in terms of just like sheer brutality and like what you see on screen, I don't know if we've topped it because I don't know something about it to me is just like we see the brain matter like speak onto the ground, like we don't. <laughs> we don't we, we don't cut away at all. We, we, we see his brains. We see his brains exit his head and drop onto the floor. And it's like, ah, I don't know if we've gotten as, as insane as that with any of these shows. I like, think you're right. You know what, you're right. The, the eye gouging in Punisher is, I think, the closest we've ever gotten to that. That's, that's the one thing that I think gets close. But yeah, that um, that kind of violence is all over Frank Mil Frank Miller's original run, and um, it was great to see that, you know, just being able to be presented on screen. Yeah, and it's like especially because again, this is the thing coming off of the movies, and this is 2015, the last movie we had. I want to say Age of Ultron, right? No, 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 because I remember distinctly uh, people getting kind of like, eh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because this came out in the lead-up to Age of Ultron, and Foggy has that line about machines taking over. And, uh, yeah, so... I'm pretty I sure he's referencing the... Terminator when he makes that joke, but okay. Yeah, but in the context of the universe, it's like, that's something that's about to happen, and no one even knows it. But, um... <laughs> Yeah, I want to say the last movie to pre uh, precede this show is Guardians of the Galaxy. So coming off of that and into this, and it's like as brutal as it is, it's like, wow. And and this is before, again, the Netflix shows kind of continue to distance themselves from the movies with like the weird timeline and keeping the references as vague as possible. But it's like, thinking of this as in the same universe, and it's like... It really is just a one-two punch of like how the, the the versatility of the source material and how far we can stretch this universe in either direction 
Like, we can have a comedic romp about the talking tree and the talking raccoon and, like, Chris Pratt being a goofball. Meanwhile, also, some guy's getting his brain bashed in and it's full... It's, you will see his brains on screen and we will not bother to, like, sugarcoat it at all. And good people will die and drop like flies all over the show. And it's just, ah. Uh, it's like, it really is. I, I think this show, <clears throat> not even the Netflix shows in general, just specifically this season, did the MCU a lot of favors. Because it showed people that, like, if the movies aren't your thing, or you think the movies are too tame or not mature enough for your taste, there are still things in this universe that we can do that'll be like, like okay, this is for me then. Yeah, I, I really like that. It presented a nice palate cleanser to the people who are like, um, the Marvel movies are just, you know, too jokey. They don't take them so seriously enough and they're just kind of schlocky popcorn <laughs> movies. Which, you know, yeah. even though it came before this was Winter Soldier, so that's like, I don't know, this... I know that they don't, like, coordinate at all, but, like, the guys who just decide when this stuff gets released, they're either really lucky or they plan this stuff really well as, like, perfect counter-programming to themselves. Well, I believe Bob Iger uh, was in charge of um, the TV side of Marvel um, when Season 1 comes out. I don't remember when exactly he's fired and someone else takes his place or whatever but uh yeah bob Iger is in charge of all the netflix stuff and shield um when season one comes out i don't know when exactly that changes um, bob Iger is like or at the time is just high up in disney and the guy who is more i don't know if hands-on is the right word but like sort of nominally in charge of the tv side of things for a long time is Ike Perlmutter, who is infamous for being, like, really... Oh, recruit. I got those two confused. That's who I meant. Yeah, yeah, Ike Perlmutter, who's infamous for being really difficult to work with and kind of reclusive, and no one has any photos of him past, like, the 70s. And he gets fired, I want to say, because he's... The thing is, he has a hand in the TV side and the movie side, and he infamously like makes things difficult for Kevin Feige and Joss Whedon and stuff for a really long time. And he gets booted, I wanna say, like right before we get into phase three. So Ant-Man, I think, the last movie where he's in charge around. Uh, to be honest with you, um, like a lot <laughs> of fans to this day are still complaining that we don't see these Netflix characters in the movies. Um, I. I don't really need or want that. I mean, the only two shows I'm invested in out of the Netflix shows at this point are Jessica Jones and Daredevil. Jessica Jones to a much lesser degree um, because I like season two, but I had a lot of issues with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm only interested in two shows out of the five that we have now. And uh, well, no, I'm interested in Punisher too. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Punisher season two. I don't want to discount that but uh yeah i think on the whole though these shows really aren't great anymore <laughs> in a weird way they're kind of harder to sit through than the arrowverse cw shows right now because at least yeah, those, yeah. at least those are having fun i mean there's a lot of really dumb cheesy and contrived um uh storylines and uh and forced drama but at least those shows are having fun. Yeah, the big yeah. thing with these shows is just they're never boring. Like, and and again, the Arrowverse does just presentation-wise what I've wanted these shows to do forever, and we still aren't at a place where they're doing. And again, this comes back to these shows not capitalizing on the world I feel like I'm promised at the end of this season, which is... I feel like at the end of this season, going forward, you can do shows where it's just these guys fighting supervillains on the ground. 
Like, maybe take a bad guy that's really interesting and has some cool powers, and maybe if you want to keep it within your budget, fine, don't go overboard, but like, a couple episodes. A couple episodes spent on one bad guy, and let's see who Luke, Cage, eh, Luke Cage's new bad guy is. Have that, see how he takes him out in a couple of hour-long episodes, and then we can move on to something else. Or like Daredevil. Like, I like so you, you want those shows to start going episodic? Not necessarily. Like, I'm fine with having an arc, but I want conflicts to be more self-contained. Because I love the thing we do at the beginning of uh, Daredevil Season 2, which is we have four episodes, which is Daredevil versus Punisher. And then that four-episode conflict between them has an ending. Punisher gets arrested. Daredevil kind of gets a moment of triumph. That's where that episode ends, and it's sort of self-contained. The next episodes are the trial of the Punisher, and that can be its own thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, like, you just drop threads and never pick them up. You can have a thread seem, like, finished in one episode, and then it'll get picked up in the next episode. And it's like, oh no, there's still more stuff we have to deal with. But I would like to do the thing that the Arrowverse shows do sometimes, which is just like, let's just see what a day is like for these guys fighting crime. Where, like, not everything is one long conspiracy over the entire 13 episodes. Let's just see a bad guy come out and yeah, then change your day. I think what you're suggesting is pretty cool. Um, because with the Arrowverse, particularly with the first two seasons of Arrow and the first two seasons of uh, The Flash, there is a lot of filler, but you cut the filler out, and what you have is a show that is like, it's episodic. And at the same time, it's you're getting a long form story. Like they blend the two together pretty well. Like people hate filler just on principle, but I think there's a middle ground where it's like you can just have a self-contained episode where it's like a character will have a conflict. It can be internal or external, but by the end of the episode, it can be resolved. And I feel like these shows are lacking that sense of resolution until the final episode of whatever the season is. And I can understand that, wanting to do like a 13 hour movie with each season, but I don't know if it always has to be that way. Like you can do interludes. And to tie into uh, what you brought up about people wanting these tied into the movies, I think I'm in a middle ground where I won't complain necessarily that these won't tie into the movies, especially because they have an out in terms of the timeline, where they're really vague about it and whatever little hints they do give always suggests that they're like a couple of years behind whatever's going on in the movies. It's not something I need, like you said, but it is something I want. I do want to see like, Luke Cage and Captain America team up and be like super strong Boy Scouts together. And I want to see like Jessica Jones like be drinking buddies with Tony Stark or something. Or I want to see like, okay, something happened. Again, like something's happening with like a super villain. How can you maybe bring in the defenders and have them be useful and do something where like, not to say that the choreography in these shows is bad at all, but like, how can you maybe take them and bring them into the sort of choreography world of the movies where it's like, put them in a real big action scene. It's like, I don't know. Like, I, I'm, I've i accepted at this point that it's not going to happen anytime soon. But the idea that it could happen is just forever enticing to me. And it would be so cool to see, I think. Uh, and yeah, for especially me personally... With, like, Oh, go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say, especially with something like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or even something like Runaways, because unlike these shows, those can go a bit further where it's like, we'll really get into like, okay, we've got a dinosaur that will listen to these two girls. And uh, we've got that. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I got distracted by something. We've got, uh, we've got like a dinosaur that'll listen to these two girls and we've got like the aliens that'll show up in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and we've got spaceships and stuff. And it's like, that material is ripe to like, 
intersect with the movies and we keep getting chances to do it and then they don't capitalize on it and with agents of shield especially it bothers me because those are keeping up with the movies timeline wise they're really explicit about that and it's ah it bothers me when they just keep missing opportunities and i'm like what's the point of having a connected universe if you're not gonna like explore the connections um it i i get what you're saying but it's it's too much of an issue money wise and logistics wise um robert downey jr is not going to agree to be in an episode of television for a reasonable amount of money he's just not <laughs> My preference is to bring TV characters into a movie rather than put the movie characters on the shows. Now, see, that 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 was I think Captain Lo- Captain Logan uh, brought up. I can't remember where, but in one of his videos, he was like, "Yeah, it's asking too much for people to uh, like to to be watching all these shows, well, all the movies and the shows, and just throw one of the show characters." into a movie and expect that everyone has seen said show that's asking too much of a general audience and i do kind of agree with that especially when they're trying to be super accessible to the general absolutely. audience oh sorry go ahead i absolutely agree with you. at the same time my counter argument for that is like civil war where we will bring in Ant-Man, who had his own movie that not a lot of people saw, and we will bring in Spider-Man, who hasn't had his own movie yet, but who's clearly been Spider-Man for a while and That's had his not own a adventures off-screen. Like bringing in Spider-Man, like Spider-Man, one of the most popular characters in all of pop culture, kind of is not a risk at all for that movie. Even though people <laughs> hated Spider-Man too. Putting Spider-Man in your movie is not that big of a risk. Um, I know. With, with Ant-Man, he got a movie. He got a big release, mainstream movie. Not everyone saw it, but it was put out, and people saw it. So like, it's in the consciousness. But it's not so much a matter of it being a risk as just like how that movie handles it regardless. Where like you could never have even heard of Spider-Man and in the context of that movie, it's still fine because the movie goes out of its way to explain to you who this guy is. And well, we can't do that for natural. every Netflix character. If we throw Are them into sure? a movie. Because maybe if you took all of them and threw them into one movie, that wouldn't work. But I could see, like... Again, it all depends on like how good the writer is. The Russos are really good at making it so... Even if you haven't been keeping up with all these characters, we'll throw in just enough stray lines of dialogue where it's like, okay, you understand why they're here in the context of this story? If, say, let's say, just for instance, because Vincent D'Onofrio has actually brought this up, let's say a Spider-Man movie comes out where Kingpin is the villain and Daredevil then gets involved somehow. You don't have to establish, you don't have to like spend the whole scene expositing to the audience that this is what Kingpin's been up to, this is what he's done before, this is his and Daredevil's relationship. All you have to do is say, this is Kingpin, he's a new crime boss, or he's been in prison for a while, now he's out, he's causing trouble for Spider-Man. Daredevil comes in and he's like, hey, Kingpin and I have history, let me help you out here. Give some natural dialogue that's like, daredevil's been around for a little while he's done some stuff but now what matters for the purpose of this appearance is what happens in this movie i don't think that's difficult to do uh fair enough um i want to uh i want to get in the nitty-gritty of season one itself we've talked a lot about like retro like retrospectively how we feel about it with all the other shows and the movies now (laughs) Uh, but just looking at this as a piece, as its own thing, um, <clears throat> uh, I really, I really, really like this uh, this show. Um, it is, you know, a 13-hour movie, and I've I, I, I did a really interesting experiment last year where I watched it like once as a binge, and then once as 
watching one episode a day. Um, and it was really interesting having that experience. Um, I, I can't really say it was radically different watching it that way, um, but it was kind of a different way to digest it. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the, the story as it's presented, I like that we, we start the show with, uh, we're immediately, we're not trying to give you the entire origin all at once. We're just establishing this character is blind um, and uh, he's a lawyer, um, he's a Catholic, go. And we're, we're not we're not doing the pilot eyes thing of trying to throw the entire origin at you in one hour. Um, it's yeah. very it's very gradual, um, like, and we don't even get the major stick type stuff, which is a lot of the real meat of the origin. We don't even get that until the seventh episode. Um, but they <clears throat> they they trust the audience so much, and they're not giving us anything other than what we need to understand the story that they're telling. And I really appreciated that. And I feel like, again, Spider-Man and Civil War, it's sort of the same approach there, where the reason for it was just people were sick of seeing the origin done over and over again. But the end result is the same, where it's like, Spider-Man and Daredevil are both introduced to the audience as like, They've been doing this for a while. The origin is done. We're not in origin territory necessarily, but they're still not the character as you know them. So like Spider-Man's not really Spider-Man yet. He doesn't have the proper suit and stuff. And Daredevil's not really Daredevil yet. He doesn't get a suit until the end. But we're not like bogging it down and like, this is how they decided to become a superhero and we're gonna have you wait through that whole thing before we get into them doing what they do. And I'd actually forgotten that we see Matt's first night out visualized in, uh, again, the Nelson B. Murdoch episode when he's talking about the guy who uh, abused his daughter. That's us seeing like the actual like origin, origin of like, this is Daredevil's first night out on the job. And that's not until episode 11. And so it's like, you're right, they really trust the audience to be like... Episode 10, but yeah. Oh, episode 10. But yeah, they trust the audience to be like, even if you don't know who Daredevil is, you're smart enough to understand that he he came from somewhere and we'll give you the details later, if at all. Um, I, I like how slowly we, we build up to Kingpin. We don't get him in person till the end of the third episode. And uh, I, I love that it's such an understated and emotional moment. It's not like, dun dun dun, here's your big bad guy. It's yeah. it's a really like somber, quiet moment. Like with him and Vanessa in the art gallery and how he feels lonely. That's a really ballsy way to introduce your villain for a comic book show. Yeah, and it's also ballsy in the sense that uh, Leland, who we haven't talked about at all, who I think is really entertaining and really fun, he has a line uh, in his last scene where he's like, you've been getting erratic and emotional and weak ever since Vanessa came into your life. And that's the first moment that we meet him, is like, the, the show does this cool thing where Fisk is off screen and unknown to the audience outside of just as this really powerful entity for a couple episodes and then the moment we see him is the moment he meets the love of his life who will then make him stop being as powerful so like all of the control fisk has over like the entire enterprise and like his own emotions that is lost the second that he's introduced to the audience we never get to see Fisk on screen as completely in control guy. Yeah, not until we get to, to season two later where I think he gets back to that guy and then some. Yeah, and again, that's when Vanessa's not there, so that's really interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if um, he maintains that in season three and brings her back. Mm. Or um, if, like, again, 
matter of because she's in such close that close proximity to him, that's that puts her in danger and that throws him off his game a little bit. Yeah, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see that. But uh <clears throat> I like um like how deeply rooted the whole crime enterprise is. It almost feels like the uh the John Wick thing, like where assassins are everywhere. It feels like Kingpin has people in his pocket everywhere. Yeah. yeah. It's honestly kind of scary. Like um the scene with uh the guy the guy who um what oh no, it's another Russian guy. Another Russian guy is in the uh the, the thing being interrogated by uh Blake and Hoffman and he lets slip Fisk's name and then they're like uh, it's your turn. It's like, no, I took it for that thing in the bodega, and you're like, for a second, what are they talking about? And then one of them punches the other one. I think it's Blake punches Hoffman. It's like, oh, oh, no. And then the gunshot rings out, and you have, like, the same feeling as Matt does, which is just like, oh, no, it's everybody. It could be anyone. Like, no, no avenue is safe. Everyone is in Fisk's pocket somehow. The only one that we know isn't on the entire force is uh, Brett. Yeah. And I like that Brett keeps coming back. And not even just like Brett. He's got to be the one good cop for like as much as these shows kind of have natural tension with cops. It's like him and Misty Knight. And he has one of the funniest lines in the whole show um, in the final episode where he says, uh, or, or Foggy says, um, you're the only cop on the force we know for sure is honest. And he's like, you ever seen a turf coat? Um, honest cops are usually the ones that get shot in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and like also, speaking of like funny things, last episode, Turk. Turk is great. And like, even though I think it's kind of both funny and weird that we begin like a gradual degradation of him. Like Turk is almost the anti-Claire. Whereas, like, as each season goes, Claire has been building up and building up. Turk starts the first episode of this show as kind of a genuine threat. And, like, for a couple episodes, Turk is, like, genuinely scummy and kind of threatening. And you're like, oh, man, such a bad guy. And then as these shows keep going, he just becomes more and more laughable until eventually in Luke Cage Season 2, he's just, like, selling bones to people. <laughs> yeah, like he he's kind of Daredevil's punching bag. Like um with he's Spider Man, a- you have those those villains where uh those villains where um he's they're literally just punching bags for Spider Man. And Turk is kind of that for Daredevil. And like I like that we sort of begin that with uh the, the brilliant montage at the end. Uh not at the end, but like toward the middle of episode thirteen where it just opens with him running away from the cops in slow-mo, and he just, he's got this look on his face, like, Jesus Christ, it's great. Um, And also, just because, uh, oh, unless you wanted to talk more about that, I found one thing in my notes that I wanted to mention before I forgot. Go ahead. It's the scene, it's the the, the opening to the episode after uh, uh, Vanessa gets poisoned, I really love this thing that they do where uh, they open with a cartoon. I think it's like a Looney Tunes cartoon. And I'm like, why are they opening with this? And then Fisk bursts in with Vanessa and uh, he like, she gets taken on one of the gurneys and he tries to go in with her. And they're like, you got to stay out here. And he's like, do you know who I am? And they're like, we don't care. Sign the thing. You're staying out here. And like, she might die and everything is in chaos and he's just completely lost all of his power in that moment and that cartoon is still playing in the background and it's like this big strong beefy guy who's just beating up on this little dude and then gradually over the course of the scene the cartoon goes on and he's losing the fight until the big beefy guy just loses and that's when the opening titles play and it's like playing right next to fisk's head and i'm like that's great. That's such a subtle little... A lot of people wouldn't even pick up on that, but, like, that whole cartoon is symbolizing Fisk's, like, mindset and his loss of control, and he's still big and in charge, but it doesn't mean anything, and he could lose everything, and it's such a 
uh, whoever thought of that little bit for that scene is a genius. They, they really are, man. I picked up on that, I think, the sixth or seventh time I watched this show, which really says something because this really is one of those shows where you can go back and rewatch it, and there's all these little things you don't pick up on, and you have a almost a totally different experience. Um, yeah, to just... The, the, the moment... Um, I remember initially when I first saw the show, that moment like really stuck out to me when he says, do you know who I am? And the woman tells him, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter who he is. And, uh, and she's like, fill out the paperwork, we'll update you when we know anything. And the, doze, and the doors close in his face and you just, you see that look of helplessness and distraught in his face. And it's like, this is the one thing he thought he'd never have to feel since he started maintaining all this wealth and power and it all just comes crashing down in those few seconds. Yeah. yeah. Like, <clears throat> if you want to go like really extreme with it, you could even say he feels like his dad in that moment because his dad was such a jerk because he was he was perceived as a loser and like helpless and he tried to accumulate power but it didn't mean anything in the end. And like he's been trying to distance himself from that the whole time and now he's like no now he knows what it's like to lose and it's so ah um i want to talk uh like story-wise a little bit more about matt so um matt fun just fundamentally as a character is incredibly interesting um mm. you've got this guy who's a catholic and a lawyer and a vigilante and he believes very much in all those things even though two out of the three is like them together yeah a super strong contradiction and um like you see the epitome of that in the third episode where they defend um one of the uh the hitmen for fisk and uh he's like whether he's a good man or not it doesn't matter like as he's giving that whole like beautifully incredibly written speech he knows that that guy is dirty and he's um, he's a killer and a douchebag, but he's defending him because he knows that's what he has to do to keep the lights on in his firm. And because law wise, like that's that's just how the situation has to go. There's no, there's no evidence that, uh, well, the prosecution couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he wasn't justified in defending his life, even though we the audience know he just deliberately murdered a dude um, there's no proof of it and like the way the law is set up there's just they have to let this guy walk and so that's yeah, what he's yeah. laying out for the jury and you he can argue in the back of his mind when he says beyond these walls he may, he may well face a judgment of his own making he's talking about himself in the mask he's like yeah, as, soon yeah, as, yeah. as soon as this trial's over I'm gonna mess this dude up and I'm gonna have him tossed in jail yeah, that whole thing is such a perfect like encapsulation of that contradiction where Matt Murdock believes in upholding the law to the extent that like he will preach to these other people about the importance of the law and how you've been picked as jurors, it's your duty within the law to do what's right by like the facts. And then he 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 sort of and again, this ties into his whole martyr angle. It's almost like he takes on the burden of having to, like, go outside the law where these people shouldn't have to. And so they don't have to, where it's like, you can rest assured that he will suffer the fate that he deserves, but it shouldn't be at your hands because that's not right. And so it'll have to be by my hands. And, and then you've got that line in the finale where um, they find out where Hoffman is being held up and Matt leaves to go stop uh, Fist's men from killing him and get him to uh, the precinct so that he can uh, drop the information on Fisk. And um, Foggy stops him and he says, I know how you feel about what I do, Foggy, but this is the part where law meets reality. Either I put on the mask or Fisk wins. Like he, he knows that the law is like very limited and very flawed and it can't fix every problem and so he takes it upon himself when he deems it necessary to go outside the law 
Yeah, and exactly, exactly the same way that thinks. Because Fisk has this mindset of like, there are horrible things outside of the law that shouldn't be done. And so I'll do them so that other people don't have to. And I'll take on that burden to make things better. Except he goes farther with it and he crosses that line, which is like the sanctity of life. And that's where he and Matt have to naturally be enemies. And uh, we haven't actually like gone very deep into like the Catholic angle of Matt's character. But I really admire that. And another thing that I think sort of like was, at least for me, really interesting is like this in compared to the movies is that up to this point, religion didn't really come up in any Marvel stuff in terms of movies or like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or anything. But now we have this show that's about this character who is a devout Catholic and is like his religion really does define him in a lot of ways and the show doesn't shy away from that or having discussions about that and it's really interesting and unique and uh, yeah, I, I love Fisk, that yeah and Fisk is explicitly not a religious person and he even has a line that I think is really interesting and again when Vanessa's poisoned he's like uh, he says something about like even God if there is such a thing couldn't stop me from making whoever did this to you pay and it's like ah that's great because he to the extent that fisk even believes in god he sees himself as like almost above him and it's there's so much stuff to unpack there and it's really great um yeah we didn't talk about the priest at all i freaking love the priest he's so he's great. great um and I love that that's how we initially introduced Matt, um, that it's just like a lot of shows, um, like, and I've heard a lot of people who uh, were even complaining about this show when it came out, that um, there wasn't enough action and that it was a little too talky and we didn't open with him beating people up just like as soon as it opens. I really appreciate, I have a lot of love and respect for this character and his ideology. And I really appreciated that we opened with him in a confessional. I think that was, I mean, you can, you could kind of call that obvious, but I think it was an inspired choice. Yeah. And like, I could at even watching this for the very first time and maybe even the second time, I think, where like, I thought that that was just a weird first foot forward. And I didn't even necessarily want opening on action. I just felt like it was weird that we're opening in such a like, in a moment that's almost devoid of any kind of tension. Where it's like, it really is just two people sitting down. One of them is just kind of unloading all of his baggage and the other one is there to listen. And it's just kind of a moment of reflection. And it's kind of weird to open your story with a moment of reflection, but at the same time, it's so fitting for this character and it immediately sets the pace for like, what this guy's internal conflict is gonna be, not just for like the next 13 episodes, but for season two and into Defenders and now into season three. Like that speech is, Matt Murdock's whole thing just wrapped up right, right, right for you in the first moments of the show. Had a lot of the interesting stuff to say, and um, I liked how down to earth the priest was too. Like when he's talking about how they got uh, new coffee machines, and Matt is sitting on the uh, on the bench. He's like, yeah. "Yeah, we got new coffee machines," and and, and like he, he just his his uh, little jabs, like comments about the coffee machine I felt were really great and really brought the character down to earth. Yeah, he does have a bias, early attitude that tends to be given to, like, priest characters. No, he feels like a, a real person, and like a down-to-earth person who, yes, is religious and very much believes in that, but he, he's also he's also a human being and you can talk to him on that level. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly um, his story um, about how he uh, how he first saw the devil 
Yeah. I thought was really interesting. And one of, that's one of like those scenes where you're just watching two people talk and it is so captivating. Yeah, and like, uh, I, those moments, the two of them particularly, are like stuff that slipped my mind not having watched a season in a while. But now I feel like that's gonna stick with me just because it didn't really like hit me the first time until like right now where it's like, there's this guy out there who ev he's, even if you disagreed with him, he was so like just captivating and respectable that he'd managed to gain sort of like everyone's sort of uh that deference and then there are just some people out there in the world who are monsters who are not gonna buy into that and the great thing is at that point in the show and arguably even still now that's not what fisk is and that's not what anyone really is no, um, I'm wondering because I, I, you could act. Oh, sorry, you, you should make your point first. Okay, I was just gonna say that uh, when he says that uh, that that man talked with uh, Kahiji in his hut for many hours and then hacked him to pieces. Yeah, with his that, family. <laughs> yeah, and his family. That was utterly terrifying to me, um, and that kind of for me that that kind of just encapsulates that that feeling of evil like the fact that this this guy was willing to just sit down and talk to this dude for who knows how long instead of just killing him right away is utterly terrifying yeah because yeah. then he wonder, was he really even giving him a chance to make his case or was he just toying with him yeah like was it just some sick thing for him to think he could eventually like have this guy like change his mind and let him see his family or even let him live. Or like he, he walks into that hut, like with purely no intention of changing his mind. And he's just entertaining this guy before he kills him along with his family. Yeah. yeah. I know I kind of coming back to this character in little ways, but like I, I keep thinking and the one person in this show who I think maybe actually fits that description is Leland because Fisk cares about people and he keeps parroting the fact that he takes no pleasure in what he does and whether or not that's true you can debate like clearly he takes pleasure in beating on people maybe he doesn't actually take pleasure in killing anyone though uh and well, wait Nick before you before you keep going with that point I just want to say in my opinion anyway I think it's very evident that he enjoys killing at least two people in this show. And that's um, Anatoly and Ben Yurik. He has a smile on his face after he's done choking out Ben. And it's mortifying. Yeah. So, like, you can argue that that, like, again, it could be a thing of, like, like Matt Fisk has a thing where he's got the devil in him. And that's not who he is always, but it can be brought out of him and it'll come out in moments. But everyone in this show has a level of respect for other people, at least. Like, Madame Gao is very much about, like, she seems to genuinely care for Fisk's best interest just because he shows her courtesy and he seems like... Like, like, she can buy into what he wants to do just because he's passionate about it and he seems like his heart is in the right place. And she's willing to put up with that. Wesley and Fisk clearly care for each other. Vanessa and Fisk, Matt and his whole circle. Leland is the... Uh, Anatoly and Vladimir, they have each other. Leland has his son, but his son we never see. And all of the interactions with anyone he actually has, Leland has respect for nobody. And he yeah, he's kind of just generally mean-spirited throughout the entire show. Yeah, like, he can be casual, and he'll have, like, casual conversations with people where they're, like, on the same page. But if it's not benefiting him, he doesn't care about anyone. I could see him sitting with a guy for several hours, and if he can't get anything out of it, sure, he'll hack him to pieces. He's the one guy I could see just doing that because... 
Um, I don't picture... I mean, the only weapon that we see... Granted, he's super old. Yeah. Um, but the only, the only weapon that we see him use is a taser. Yeah, I don't see um, that. Basically, I don't buy that he do actually, like, try to kill anyone himself. But he's certainly comfortable with ordering hits on people on a dime. Yeah, I don't think he'd get his hands dirty in that way. But I mean, like, in terms of the kind of guy he is. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. And he's also really funny, too. Yeah. Like, even initially, when we get our introduction to him, and he's talking to Nobu, and he's like, can you at least pretend to be cold? It's unsettling. <laughs> yeah, he's great. And it's like, here's a question. On the first viewing, uh, did you see it coming that he was that he had anything to do with the poisoning? Because uh, I don't remember. Yes. yes, I did. Weirdly enough. Yeah, I, I don't did, remember if I. I did suspect but, that he has something to do with it. Yeah, but looking back on it, he's being really obvious with like how not involved he is pretending to be. Yeah, like he's. Everyone else is kind of caught up in the moment, and he's constantly like questioning things. And it's like, why are you so level-headed about this? Why do you have all these questions, if not to draw attention away from yourself? Yeah, like, uh, I had a glass in my hand. Should anyone be looking at me? Yeah, like, that, that, I think you can just take as him being kind of selfish and just, like, it's a funny Leland line. But then it'll get to, like, when things have calmed down a little bit and he's with Wesley and it's like, so who do you think did it, huh? You think it was Gal? You think it was Nobu? Do you think it was Nobu's guys? You think it was Devil Tells? You think it was the guy in the mask? It's like he keeps asking and prodding about it. It's like, can you just, who cares? Like, you are clearly just covering for yourself. Um, yeah, that was the moment where I'm like, yeah, this is definitely him because I I questioned it. Um, like my mind started to, to, to race once I saw that Vanessa was poisoned. And I actually went and rewound and watched the scene where he hands her the drinks and I, Oh, yeah, yeah. That... Drinking his drink through subsequent episode. Before we get the reveal, I'm like, yeah, he didn't drink his. And on top of that, how he's acting once they get to the hospital, yeah, he did it. Yeah, and they're really clever with the way they edit it, too. Because, like, he's sort of motioning with his mouth after they, like, cut away from him and then cut back. So, like, your brain just kind of assumes that that's him swallowing the drink. But then it's like they deliberately cut away so that you don't see him not take a sip. Yeah, that's that's really smart. Um, yeah, Leland, um, he's essentially their, their money man. And uh, he's a super, uh, well... I don't know. I don't want to say interesting. He's 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 likable in that he's entertaining. He's a really entertaining presence. Um, he he's got like that uh, dry wit to him. Yeah. And uh, he's he's really great. And even uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, Wesley because he also has that dry wit. Yeah. yeah. He's <laughs> absolutely hysterical. And one of my favorite um, aspects of this season because. Um, we're introduced to him first as like our main like villainous type character, and that scene with him on the bench um, yeah. when he's uh, threatening that guy with the tablet and the like assassin sitting next to his daughter on the porch, on on the bench, um, that was like a really cool ec economic like this is everything you need to know about this guy and the organization he's affiliated with in this one scene, and it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, he's really scary because this whole conversation is terrifying, but he's got this whole attitude of like, this is just another day for him and this is just business. Yeah, like he's um, almost, I don't want to go as far as saying devoid of emotion, but he doesn't wear his emotion on, emotions on his sleeve like everyone else in the show. Yeah. Uh, well, almost everyone else, which is why, like, before we end out, we should uh, finally talk in depth about Stick. Oh my god. Yes, this... <laughs> I don't want to say that it's 
my favorite episode of the season, but the fight with him and Matt is my favorite fight scene in the whole show because um, it has the most emotional weight to it, in my opinion. Like, when, uh, when Stick kills that kid and Matt finds out about it, like, when Stick says, oh, I put an arrow in that thing's heart, and Matt, like, you can tell, like, he's reading his heartbeat even though, like, we don't hear the beating. He's like, mm-hmm. like, son of a, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know yeah. Stick is telling the truth in that moment. And he's pissed that Stick made him an accomplice to murder. Um, but not only that, that's the years of anger um, that Stick rejected him as, like, a son just all boiling up to the surface at that point. Like, Stick, like, Stick was essentially a father figure for Matt, whether he wanted to be that or not. And then, like, Matt does that gesture of giving him the uh, the, the ice cream wrapper um, as, like, a <clears throat> necklace. And then, like, Stick both figurative, figuratively and literally just crushes it and walks away and just leaves Matt alone. It doesn't give him that foggy figure that he desperately wants and arguably needs. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that... When Matt is fighting Stick in that moment, that's the anger from that point in his life all bubbling up to now, like, to the surface. And it's such a... It's such an interesting thing because there's literally no narrative stakes to that fight. Like... The f- whoever wins or loses that fight, nothing changes, nothing really matters. The, you could argue, like, on a pure moving the plot forward, moving, like, like arguments forward, that that fight is a waste of time, but it never feels like a waste of time just because it just, it needs to happen. Like, it's been building between these two, this tension, and it needs to be addressed. Because yeah, that it just will. Like you're talking Matt about. Matt tries strict, to talk strictly, to. Uh, sorry, just nope. strictly narrative wise, like you're like you were saying, that's not a fight that, um, or at least I guess for the overall story necessarily needs to be there, but I would argue that it does need to be there just for how emotionally um, effective it is for Matt as a character to get all his anger out. Um, regarding, like, Stick and how he just left him alone and walked away from him instead of yeah. being the other figure that he needed. He tries... He keeps trying throughout the, uh, the preceding episode to, like, talk to Stick. And again, he's talking to him like a deadbeat dad. And that's not what Stick is, and it's not what Stick thinks of himself as. So that approach doesn't work. Stick trained Matt with the intention that he be a weapon and a tool and so violence is the only language that Stick will listen to and so that fight has to happen because nothing Matt can say with his mouth will ever affect Stick. He has to use his fists on him. And That's that's true. I love that Stick sets himself up to be Matt's father figure completely by accident and it's purely in word choice. And Uh, It's the scene where he's talking about Matt, I mean, to Matt about his dad, where he's a kid in the training, and he's like, suck it up, your dad's dead and gone, there's nothing you can change about that. And then he says, but I'm here, and that's the moment now, and what are you going to do about that? And I think Matt, and even the audience, takes but I'm here to mean like, but I'm here to be that for you, I'm here for you even though your dad is gone. That's not what he means. All he literally means is, I'm what's in front of you. What matters isn't your daddy issues. What matters is me right now training you to be a weapon. So focus on that. And that's not how Matt takes it. And it's just a miscommunication. That is tragically true. And I I think that's what makes their relationship so, like just their relationship itself, tragic and interesting. Yeah, and also, what makes me kind of, like, sad that we never will get a moment between Stick and Fisk, because I feel like, again, this all has to do with the fact that this whole show is about paralleling uh, Matt and Fisk. All of the things that Stick 
complains about with Matt that like stops him from being a perfect soldier and a perfect weapon is also true about Fisk. And I can't help but think that if Stick were in Matt's place, Fisk would be down in like five seconds. And not just because Stick is willing to kill people, but because he has a far better grasp of his emotions than Fisk ever could hope to. And part of that is just the space around them. Like, there's a whole scene where Stick, like, gets on Matt's case about having all the stuff in his apartment. And it's like, you don't need any of this. This isn't... You think you can try and live like a normal person, but you're not. And this stuff is just artifice, and it's a waste of time, and it's a waste of energy. And then you get to the next episode where we see what Fisk's home is like, and it's all of this extravagant stuff that like food and watches and suits and it's like you don't need all of this stuff it's just kind of a distraction from yourself and so i feel like stick would have words for fisk if they ever met and he would probably take that fisk down just in a conversation not even fighting him yeah all that stuff is there so that fisk can distract himself from that little boy covered in blood that he sees in the mirror every morning yeah um, and then, but of course, actually did keep the wrapper that Matt gave him, and so what does that say? Yeah, like that. Uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, dude. That That's brought me to tears on multiple viewings. Like, yeah. I, I know that scene's going to happen, and just seeing, like, Charlie Cox's face as he's holding the wrapper, it's just... Yeah. I, I can't help but tear up almost every time. <laughs> Years, but like not even like you said not even the fact that it's there but like Matt's reaction and just that's again that's all those years of that that those emotions coming out and it's like now everything is recontextualized for him and it's such a jarring development for him like you get the sense in that scene that like as he's trying to clean up his apartment and he finds that that he completely forgot that he still had it yeah and uh, just like, as you were saying, just like coming back to that realization and looking back on like, yeah, I, I really wanted this guy to be my dad because my dad was gone and he just basically spat in my face and walked away. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Stick as a character is, is really interesting because he is kind of Matt's polar opposite. As far as we can tell, he's not really religious. Um, he believes in the mission of taking down the hand, um, but that's kind of it. That's his one singular goal. That's really the one thing driving him. Um, and he is willing to kill and doesn't literally sees nothing wrong with taking life, like nothing. Um, whereas Matt, even, even though like you take the religious thing out of the equation, he doesn't like killing people on principle. Um, it's not even the fact that his religion is holding him back from killing people. He just does not think that that's right, period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although the religion thing does recontextualize it, um, and it makes that line that Matt, that, not the Matt, that uh, Foggy says to Matt towards the end really interesting, where uh, Matt goes off to fight Fisk, and Foggy's like, if last time I saw, last time you, uh, tried to fight this guy found you half dead um if you go after him again you, you'll, you'll probably get killed or uh you'll kill him which will probably have the same effect on someone as catholic as you are hmm. uh, like what does what does a matt who has killed someone look like how does he function after that i honestly can't but i imagine that he will get there eventually you think we'll get to a place where we have Matt kill someone? Because, just because, and again, this is getting into season two, we keep kind of pushing that with him, and like all sides are kind of pushing him to kill someone, not just Punisher, but also Elektra. Both of them are kind of putting him in situations where if he doesn't kill someone, he is still in a way responsible for someone's death. And even in this season, we kind of skirt the line with what happens to Nobu. And it's like he... 
like he 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 creates the means for someone to die and then doesn't get the opportunity to save them. And so I feel like if if the idea is that we keep escalating with each season, then season three or possibly afterward is going to escalate to a point where he just cannot avoid it, and it has to happen. I think you might be right about that, and uh, part of me really wants to save this for season two, but now that we're on it, I I, I kind of can't help but mention it. Matt, well, it it. <sighs> It, it, it looks pretty clear to me anyway that we kind of have Matt kill someone at the end of season two, but we act like we didn't, almost like a BBS type thing. It's weird because you have to look at it from the perspective of like, Matt goes onto that rooftop knowing that Nobu has to be stopped and he knocks Nobu off of the building and Nobu doesn't die. But assuming that Matt doesn't know that Stick is there to decapitate him, what does Matt think happens? Like, Yeah, like, does he think he can just beat Nobu up and then toss him in a jail cell? Yeah, like, he stands there with kind of a, a look of triumph. Like, yeah, Electra's dead, and that's not triumphant at all. But, like, it is, in some sense of the word, a victory. I think we're supposed to take it that way. But it doesn't make any sense for Matt to look at it that way, with no No, still Matt around. like whips, like uses his billy club, like grapple to like whip someone off of a building. Yeah. Like he, there's no way that he thinks, like that he's surviving that. Like, well, it's no. He knows Nobu's got like his weird immortality, whatever. And I think at that point. He has it confirmed for him that it takes like special conditions or like a decapitation or something of that kind to like kill him permanently. So the way I always took that scene is like Matt knocks him off the building, assumes that that's not enough to kill him correctly, and then just doesn't do anything. Oh, okay. Um, well, once I I haven't gone back to season two nearly as much. So once we rewatch that, I'll probably. Um, have think, different feelings about it. I think, but like, no matter which one of us is right, it's still weird for Matt in that situation to react the way he does and to not talk about it again. Um, but yeah, mo mo moving back to Stick, I think um, the actor's perfectly classed. He uh, he also has that again that great dry wit thing that you just can't go wrong with with the characters in this show. Um, when, uh, when Stick makes, uh, I remember the first time I watched the show and Matt makes Stick promise not to kill anyone when they go on the mission to take down the black sky and he yeah. calls him the P word <laughs> and, uh, like when, when Stick's just, as you said, like nagging him about all the stuff he has, um, and he's so like callous about it. You really get the sense that um, Stick really wants to. He's not just talking down to Matt. He genuinely wants Matt to come back over to his side and just be a soldier and drop the whole selfless hero act. Yeah, but again, he has no idea how to hate that. And it's like they 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 have that moment, like you said, where uh, it's like I swear I will not kill anybody, and like he calls him a few words. In the moment, it's funny, but then looking back, it's just another another facet of, like, Stick is just really, really awful to him because he's just bald-faced lying to him right there. Like, he just does not care about Matt's feelings at all. And, uh... Or, like, him. Yeah, um, we'll talk about Defenders, uh, when we get there, but, uh... I think one of my biggest issues with Defenders, aside from the fact that the hand is nothing, is that uh, we kill Stick. And I really don't like that, because like, like as, as you were saying, I think it would have been really interesting to put Stick and Kingpin in a room together. And I can't really think of a place where that's been done in the comics. Yeah. Uh, I would want to do that. Look, I don't have a problem with the because even as early as this season, we're setting up the chase, we're setting up uh, 
like the fa- the black sky it's something that's gone stick says for now it's going to become a problem later defenders is the culmination of all that stuff it makes sense that that's where stick's story would end i have problems with how it happens but we'll get into that and also before i forget uh we see at the end of that episode in the season uh someone who i think is supposed to be stone from the comics it's the guy with the scars on his back and uh he will never come up again so that's, yeah, that's a, really weird especially because we do the hand and the chase in season two yeah yeah it's just i don't know i'm i'm moving into final thoughts now because we're we've been going for almost if not more than two hours i think and this just comes back to the thing of like this season is just really really amazing and outside of the weird lazy writing of the wesley death bit all of the issues with it stem from being let down by what comes after it and it's it's really weird to me that they had the plan for defenders as because it, looking at these shows even though the quality of them ranges from good to bad to great or whatever from show to show it always feels like they're just making it up as they go it never feels like they have a plan from season to season and yet i'm led to believe that that's exactly what was going on i'm just like how is that that's that's very true especially because ironically enough um jeff Loeb is the uh from my understanding, the Kevin Feige of the Netflix shows, at least mm-hmm. when they announced this deal, like he's supposed to be like creatively overseeing everything and making sure that it all like lines up and builds um, in a satisfying way when we get to Defenders. Um, not only can I say that he did a pretty terrible job of that, um, if he even did it at all, because it really feels like he just, um, you know, clocked in and then went home every day like it doesn't feel like he's tried at all to uh to make sure we built to defenders in an organic and interesting and compelling way and make defenders worth the wait once we finally get to it but um <clears throat> uh season two um i'm guessing you don't know this because you didn't know about uh the whole plan for defenders to be the end game season two of daredevil was not um guaranteed when they announced this deal i knew that um, yeah. oh okay yeah they don't green light season two until season one comes out and everyone's going crazy for it yeah yeah and it's, it's just <laughs> in complete turn the movies don't always pay off their setups in the best way either like i'm still waiting for uh, the leader in the abomination to become a thing again but um uh, when they do, like it's it's a it's a matter of the payoffs don't always happen, but when the movies do a payoff to a setup, it's usually satisfying and makes sense for the characters and the story and the themes and stuff. Here, it's not that there's anything logistically all that wrong with the payoffs. Like there are plot holes, but we'll get to those as they hit us. But it's just that, like. You do such a good job setting it up as something interesting, and then the payoff just it. Um. Oh, I want to talk about one more thing before I forget. Um, mm-hmm. Intros are very important to me with TV shows. Um, I think having a good intro is important. Um, I think it it lays the uh, it it sets the tone in a really cool way, and it's just cool to see. Um. And I don't like that we've gotten away from that so much with with TV shows. Like um, with Arrow, we just get the title card. With Flash, we just get the title card, which is the Flash one's actually really really cool, and I like that one. But I don't know. I prefer having intros to my shows. Um, even cartoons go back and forth on it these days. Like uh, to, a lot of them have intros, but some of them don't. And I'm like, why not? What could possibly be wrong with just like the young Young Justice had a very, very short intro, and sometimes they wouldn't even play that. They would just play Young Justice, the title card. And I'm like, no, guys, intros best foot forward. Come on. And yes, the intro to these shows, with 
the exception, I think, of Iron Fist and arguably Defenders. I really like the intros, but this show in particular, like, this intro is inspired. Oh, I was just going to say that, man. It's perfect. It's so perfect. And that theme, yeah. so, so good. Instantly iconic, and I just, whenever I'm watching the show, I'll never skip the intro because I love it so much. Yeah. Like, I think it intro, like, it, it, it really sets up how how important the setting of Harlem is. Jessica Jones, I think, has a great intro with the colors and sort of like putting you in the setting of a PI. And I really like just the music for that one, too. Iron Fist and Defenders are okay. Iron Fist, I think, is just kind of boring to look at. Defenders, the colors are nice, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of generic. This one, though, is just... The, the, the blood coming down and sort of like covering the invisible objects and it ends with the uh it ends with the heartbeat that's great and you're right the song is just such a great song and it really captures it's both epic and appropriate for an action series but also really melancholic and captures sort of like the feeling of the character and it's it's so perfect and they and the logo is even just the classic Daredevil comics logo that you'll see on like the tile, like cover of every Daredevil comic. And it's just, it's so damn cool. And they, they prove in just the intro alone, how much love and reverence they have for this character, just how smart they are in adapting this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I don't but, know. Yeah. I, I've, just, I've tapped out on things to say for now. Okay, I think we'll have a lot more to say come up. Well, maybe not a lot more, but it will be very interesting talking about uh, season two um, because uh, I love that season as well. Um, but I, I, I will admit just right here that it's not as good as season one and it's a lot more problematic, but we will get there. Um, just so people know what to expect, do you want to jump to season two or do you want to like try and uh, talk about each of these shows? We're like, um, we do just next. Which one do you think works better? I'd rather jump to season two. Okay. So yeah, that be coming in an indeterminate amount of time. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun talking about this show. Um, I'm very excited for a certain someone to be reviewing that show. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, this was just a lot of fun. Just pouring my, my thoughts out about this show and how much I love it. Um, I've been like going back, reading the comics, and um, that's also been a really cool experience having seen this show, because like I said, a lot of the characters, like not even just Matt, just even Foggy and and, uh, and Wilson Fisk, like when I'm reading the books, I now hear the voices of the actors in my head as I'm reading it. And that's just, that's a really cool cathartic experience. Yeah. Um, I uh, I love this show. It is everything that I've wanted um, for this character since I was a little kid, really reading some of the comics beforehand. And um, I could not be happier that we've gotten this. And I'm very, very, still very glad and grateful that we got it, um, even if the rest of the Netflix shows have not quite lived up to this. Yeah, and uh, like earlier, I'm really thankful to you for getting me to get off my uh, my keister and finally give it another rewatch because it is definitely worth it and uh, i can only cross my fingers that we will eventually get a show as good as this again not just from netflix but from like any of the marvel outlets uh we we haven't quite hit this bar a second time but uh fingers crossed that we will do it eventually and uh, until then we'll just we'll be seeing you later <laughs>